Okay, hi guys. So we have a uh, tonight we have Chris, we have Ivan, we have Yannick, we have Alex, and we have James. So again, we are trying to do four or five questions, and one of them will be a continuation from the problem we did last time with James, the very hard, wonderful HMNT question, right? And let's start with something slightly easier. Uh, Ivan, you have the first question ready? <clears throat> Ivan, I think your mic is not on. Oh. Okay, um, sorry. Can you put the first question up? And I can read it out. Wait, wait, wait. It. Let me ask our audience where oh. it was proposed. And they can also read the question. So you guys should be able to do this. Mm. Oh, I'm allowed to submit now. Oh, Thanks. Can now. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea where it's wrong from. Is he a panelist? Panelists cannot. No, no, no. Panelists can submit their answer too. So. Okay. It's fair. almost in 2014, right? And EMC, I don't think EMCC was around in 2014. Yeah, it was. No, I it was. EMCC. What are you talking about? It's been around for like, like almost 10 years. Yeah. By the way, EMCC, maybe some uh, uh, participants do not know it's Exeter Math Club competition that we organize every year. Uh, this year we canceled it it's because of the, <laughs> the events. <laughs> But it is a lot of fun. So we have survey results. What do people think? Uh, okay, I think sixty percent of people voted. Some of them might be still solving the problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we can read the problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's it. not from AMC. It's not from HMNT, right? Actually, it's the Armo, right? Yeah. Um, though I will say it absolutely could have been on the EMCC. N nothing really too, you know, high, high powered about this problem. So Charlie was born in the 20th century on his birthday in the year 2014. He notices that his current age is twice the number formed by the rightmost two digits of the year in which he was born. Compute the four digit year in which Charlie was born. Um, so I, I'm Chris here, and I, I wrote this problem. Um, before we start just talking about the problem, I just wanted to give a little bit of um, what inspired me to write this. Uh, I mentioned, I think, on the first show that I did that m some of my problems are autobiographical. And so sure enough, Charlie was my late dad. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away back in 2005. But when I was writing problems for the 2014 contests, I was thinking about him and I was thinking, gosh, he would be uh, whatever age this year. I'm not going to give the answer away. And then I said to myself, wait a minute, that's funny. That's actually twice the last two digits of his birth year. And if you think about how we write dates a lot of times, you know, MM slash DD slash YY, that kind of general format, we generally identify dates by, you know, the last two digits. Um, so that, for example, if someone was born in 05, um, they're either 14 or 15 this year, depending on whether they've had their birthday, or they're like a really old person and they're 115 because they were born in 1905. So this is sort of a riff on the whole Y2K thing, identifying a year by the last two digits. And I was sort of tired of seeing these classical age problems in algebra books, like John was five years older than Mary was when he, she was twice his age, blah, blah, blah. So I just thought I'd take a simple setup with just last two digits and make it into this problem. So um, so how do we start? I was born in the 20th century. 20th century means one, nine, and how do you denote these two digits? We could denote them X and Y, but actually those values are they're just digits so we could just say that the last two the the number formed by the last two digits let's just call that n so n equals 10x plus y but that ends up not being important okay so the n the 
is 10x plus y. Okay. So now we have to read the second question and the uh, condition, condition yeah. and, and write it properly, right? Yep. So that's kind of uh, usually the key in the AMC early problems that should be solved in a minute or very quickly just to understand this condition. So his age right now is what? So right now it's 2014. So what is his age? We need to figure it out, right? So his age would be what? 14 years starting from 2000. Yep. And up to that point, how old? 100 minus that number n, right? Yep. And this is twice that his age, right? Yes. So once exactly. we know how to interpret the condition, um, that's kind of the key. It's one step problem. But you have to get it right. Uh, let's solve it. 114 is equal to 3n. n is equal to what is n? 38? Yep. OK. So I think, uh, yeah, that's an easy problem. Well, well you underlined it. But remember, this is a good um, sort of reminder to answer the question asked. So yeah, 1938 is the answer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have a comment about what you did. The key is actually when you see this equation, the one you boxed to solve has nothing to do with x, y. So don't let x, y in the beginning really confuse you. I think, you know, if you start with your age as 1900 plus n might be good, right? Instead of thinking about this as two digit problem, you just think about this as a one variable problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's just, you know, a matter of what notation you use. So I like 1900 plus N as where the N represents a two digit number, possibly beginning with zero. Yeah. Um, but otherwise you could say it's 19 N and N is some two digit number possibly with leading zeros, yeah. but you're right. It's, it's kind of does confuse things. To, you don't really end up solving for X and Y you solve for N and that tells you what X and Y are. So you're right. And that was the first problem on Armel. So that was, you know, most people I think got that right. They had 10 uh, minutes yeah. to work on that and another problem. When you put the first problem on Armel, you, 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 you have a heavy responsibility. The responsibility is you almost want to make sure 90% of the people get it, right? Right. Actually, almost everyone. You want everybody to be happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's, we, we talk about on the Armel committee just there's an important distinction between there's problems that are easy to get right, but then they could also be easy to mess up and get wrong. So I wouldn't be surprised if some people wrote 38 as their answer or if, you know, like, but the idea is that um, it's just translating words into equations and just answering the question asked. So yeah, pretty straightforward. And uh, a shout out to my dad who was, <laughs> born in 38 and would have been 76 in 2014 so yeah okay so can we move on to the next one okay the next one will be a geometry question right so what's the poll here uh, do you want to give us <coughs> okay yes i'll try to launch, launch another poll give me a second guys you can also read the problem meanwhile Is the poll working? It should wor work right now. Sorry, Chris, I, I think I forgot to include you, but I think people already. <laughs> yeah, people know it's not going to be Chris. Yes. Yeah. And we have David, who usually comes to our uh, I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't write geometry problems. I don't write good geometry problems. I don't know. But I already did my problem, so I guess that eliminates me anyway. So.
Okay, let's see the results. And the results are, you should be able to see them, right? Yeah. I think most of the people think it's uh, Mr. Fong who wrote it. And then James, Alex, no, Alex, James, Yannick, and me. Okay. Yes, I think I indeed wrote this, right? So let me draw this diagram first. And when people can read this question, okay, let me go with my, okay. So you, so, so Ivan, can you draw it on your diagram over there? Then I will carry on to my diagram. Well, I think it starts with a triangle and you draw three altitudes. So very simple diagram. Yeah. And the altitudes, uh, triangle is a classic 13, 14, 15 to have nice numbers, nice area. No, 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 14 is the base. 14 is the base, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. make it easier for students. Okay, I think now, now we on, okay. And then we draw three altitudes. No, I don't think so. No, that's not true. Ah, okay. Um, I rushed. Okay. We have A, B, C. I'm sorry. And uh, we, D, A, D is the altitude, right? Right. And D is parallel, perpendicular to A, C. Yes. And A, F is it perpendicular to B, F. Yeah, that's and hard F to draw. And D. And where F is F? On the, on the e. Ah, okay. So F is here. Yeah. So that's the question, right? And you can still label 13, 14, 15 over there. So this is the problem so students can see. Right, so now you can ping to mine, right, okay. So I'm going to share three little stories about this problem before we go on to solve it, right? First story, where is this problem kind of like why it lands on AMC test? See, back then the students are still not very good at geometry, but now they are much better, the teams, right? So, and also I noticed this, on the AMCs, there are so many geometry, basically it's only using Pythagorean theorem and what? Uh, 30, 60, 90, whatever triangles. It's really getting really boring, right? <laughs> so I want to add some problems in there is involving some, you know, basic ideas that, you know, you can say Olympia problems want, right? For example, over here, recognizing similar triangles and so on. So that's the motivation. So that's why this problem was written that way. And then it happens to be this problem is problem 19 on that uh, AMC. And I can see the score gets very low after that is because people stumble on this problem. And how do I know that is uh, during our winter program when we have those AMC competition programs in the winter, some of our staff members, they are very, very strong and they go to class to teach the students. And sometimes, you know, they show, uh, they try to tell the students how to approach a problem. So once, one of our very young uh, um, teacher, uh, Patrick Young, I think he was on the, almost made the, you know, a Math Olympia, HM, went to a mob three, four times. And he was trying to, tell his students how he solved AMC questions. So he is trying to solve them without even thinking one by one. And on this show, he, is, he did with the students, this is the only problem he didn't solve. So that's made me realize, you know, how weak our students are with fundamental geometry. And then the third question I want to share with you is uh, about James, that's why I want James to be the second speaker for this problem. I put this problem on a math test in our, you know, when I teach James at Phillips X Academy, uh, when he was a ninth grader. And back then his math, uh, his geometry is also not that strong, but he made a tremendous, uh, you know, 
improvement in two or three or four years before he went to IMO. So this is also tell our, all our audience that if you really are determined, you can make lots of progress, but you cannot just stay on the stage at, at oh, I hate geometry. Oh, I'm not good at, uh, you know, uh, functional equations. Or I'm, I don't like combo. If you wanted to be good, you better do something. So this is what James, when he was a ninth grader, he did. You know, I'm going to share the solution he did. And based on what he did with me, I feel like, hmm, this kid is good because he can give me some unexpected solutions using what I just taught him, even though I was not intended to, for him to do this way, right? So when we do this 13, 14 triangle, and we, when we draw this very nice A deep uh, altitude, many of us know this, this is what? This is five and this is 12, the split, right? You can do this with lots, lots of what you want. And if you are familiar with those uh, mass counts or whatever, you can even know by heart, this is five and 12. So oh, that's nothing fancy. Nine. And nine. many times students always, when they try to do geometry, they say, I want to bash it. Ah. When, when, whenever students talk about that word, I always ask them, okay, tell me what do you do? You know, how, how, how do you really bash? Right? So if you really want to bash, use coordinates or whatever, what would be the good, good point for the origin? Many people put it here. That's a bad choice <clears throat> because all this problem, everything started with this DE. And why this is problem is a little bit hard to bash is this F is kind of like in nowhere, in somewhere on this line, right? So I recall, very well is James during the test they have 10 questions and and they have uh, they don't have too much time because there are other two much harder questions at the end so he's very quick and uh, he put this at the what at the origin James do, James do you know what you did or do you still remember I just tried this problem and I think I probably set D to be origin yes C nine nine zero uh -huh. A, 0, 12, and then parameterize F along DE. Does that work? And uh, I remember very well is in, to interpret this 90 degree in our class, we just learned how to do what? Parametric equation and a dot product. So you use the both of those skills very, very well to this power. Oh. This is what I said, oh, I like this kid. Because you described the DE by a very clear one variable motion because this slope is very clear, right? So you can find this DE is like uh, X and something X because this is have, have a nice slope or T something T because you know this wonderful slope. This slope is easy to find. This is the slope. This describes everything here. So you assume this is point F and then you look at a BF vector and FA vector. And their dot product is zero, and you give me a very nice solution because now you know T, and if you know T, then you know where F is, then everything is easy to do, right? So that's what uh, I was very, still remember very clearly. You know, that's a very, very surprising, nice solution. I mean, you wanna, might want to extend this top portion of that E. I keep looking at it and seeing a Z, and then I see an F, so I see your initials there. Here? You cannot see this? No, no, no I can no, see the E just the extend the top. Like, yeah, it looks like, yeah, it looks like a Z right now. Yes. And the uh, yes, liberal is, is nine, CD is nine. Oh, the CD is nine, yeah, not 12. A CD is nine, right, sorry. Yeah. And this height is what? This 12. height we can do very quickly, right? This is 12, right? Yeah. So you know this slope of AC, and so you, that's why you know the slope of DE very well. And this is the slope. And that give you easily two. This is 12 to nine. So this should be three to four. So three to four T, right? A uh, four T, three T. This is the ratio. Mm -hmm. And then BF has one variable in T and FA has one variable in T and the dot product, you get the T. And as soon as you get F, whatever you can, you can do, right? So that's the story I remember about James when he was young. And of course, the intended solution was about what? To see a little bit about a circle, right? 
this is what I mean earlier. I said, I want some uh, AMC questions have something to do Olympiads, not just simple Pythagorean theorem and the what, you know, and the 30, 60, 90 triangles, right? So this is- Some more triangles. Yeah, this is 90, <laughs> this is 90. Then you know these four points are what? Are on the circle. So that's how we know this angle is equal to this angle. I know everything about ABD, so I should be able to get everything about AEF because I could get AE very quickly because this is a right triangle. Uh, this is what? 9 and 12, 5, right? So I know this lens very easily. Well, this is again go to 3, 4, 5 triangle here, right? And then you can get everything. So that's the, a little bit about Olympia approach to understand the cyclic quadrilaterals. And that comes covers what I want to say. So we have two harder questions to talk about. So I I hope we have enough time to to cover them. I think students should spot that ABD is similar to AFE, right? Yeah. Okay. Then they can compute everything. Yes. Yeah. And those details we leave it to the students to try. Yeah. Okay. So we move on to the next one. Okay, I don't, should we make a poll or we just, let's solve, maybe we can just solve the problem. Yeah. I thought the next one will be this one and then we'll come back to James' uh, one million bucks problem. Yeah. So here's the next one. We have X is a positive real number. Find the maximum value of the trigonometric expression you, you see on your screen, right? Mm -hmm. And it's quite cute. I solved it today. <laughs> it, right? it was nice. Yeah. Yeah, Yvonne, I was just saying, like, when I first saw this problem, I was like, okay, so, like, let's just make sure there's, like, not, not like, tricky stuff here going on, right? So, like, one thing you can verify first is this first expression, tangent inverse of x over 9, uh -huh. always greater than the second expression, right? Yeah. And the other thing you can verify is like tangent inverse of x over nine is like always, like these are both positive. So like, okay, maybe there's some trickery actually. Cause like, maybe you can just get this, like the maximum to be some silly thing where the maximum is actually equal to one, right? Can you do that? Uh, Cause like. Well, the maximum is certainly at most one and this is at least. Yeah. So I guess the first thing I would always try, like when you have a maximum problem is see if like, make sure that like the maximum can't be one or like, why can it be one? Well, you realize it can't be one because tangent inverse is at most 90 degrees, right? Uh huh. So, you know, like this, some difference of tangent inverse is at most 90 degrees. So it's actually some like balancing between like if making the first one bigger and the second one smaller. Cause you make, if you make x super large, like it goes to zero, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they become the same because both of them are approaching. Yeah. yeah. And I guess then, like, you just get rid of stuff, right? Like, then you can get rid of the sign. The sign doesn't matter anymore. Because, I mean, if you want to find the maximum of sine of x between zero and 90 degrees, that's finding the same as the maximum of x, right? Mm -hmm. But the sign just, you can get rid of it. So you just want a maximum of this? Yeah. Uh huh. This is how you thought. I yeah. thought about this as kind of one angle, theta one, and this is another angle, theta two, right? Well, this is like the same as what I'm thinking, right? I just want to find the maximum of theta one minus theta two. Right, and you find want to find the maximum of sine of theta one minus theta two, but I don't know how to compute it. But this is offensive, right? Like, like the point is, you want to get rid of the sine or replace it with a tangent. Okay. I because agree. if you replace it with a tangent, then suddenly the tan because like you know the sine angle addition formula it uses like sine and cosine, right? You don't want to worry about sine and cosine. You want to worry about tangent. So if you try to maximize tangent of theta one over theta two, mm -hmm. I think you'll just be in a very good place. Okay, so instead of maximum of the angle, you try to maximize- Tangent of the angle. Yes, so that's what it- 
the difference of these two angles is, is between zero and 90, uh -huh. but it's still just increasing, right? Yeah. Because when you get the tangent of that angle, then you can use the uh, sine cosine relation to find the sine, right? But the tangent of tangent inverse is much easier to deal with. Because we know what's tangent of um, theta one minus theta two, right? That's tangent of theta one minus theta two. So trig formulas, knowing trig formulas comes in handy right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's plus the product, right? There's... Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So what do we have? Tangent of their difference is going to be, uh, let's see, tangent of the inverse. So it's going to be x over nine minus x over 16. One plus x over nine times x over 16, which is equal to what? Seven x over x squared plus nine times 16. Mm -hmm. And we want to maximize it, so. So what? you divided the x, right? Make both are in the, in the, in the numerator. Then you have those AMGM form. So seven, you guys can see, yes. Uh, X plus nine times 16 over X, right? Yeah. And well, X plus nine times over 16 over X by AMGM, this is at least what? Two square root of nine times 16, which is? 24. 24, right? So this is at most seven over 24. And you see how, how good are these numbers are chosen. <laughs> Tangent of an angle is at most seven over 24, right? Um, so the maximum will be when it's seven over 24, the tangent, and how do you guys find the sign? I mean, you draw a triangle of sides seven and 24, right? <laughs> and the last side becomes 25. So maximum, Theta one minus theta two will be here. Yeah. So the sign is, well, maximum of the sign will be seven over 24. Yeah. That's a cute problem. Yeah, so the seven, the seven twenty four and 25 makes me think like, can we just like do it with geometry or something? Cause like this equality case X equals 12 is also like symmetric, right? It's mm -hmm. like one of them is like, like tangent inverse of 12 my over nine is like the, co the complement of tangent inverse of 12 over 16, right? So maybe there's something going on here. Yeah, uh, okay, okay. First of all, I should say that like I wrote this problem. Um, yeah, so like, um, so yeah, like I'm actually a little bit surprised that like there's actually a pure trick metric. So I probably should not be surprised because well, everything's trick and you can do everything's trick. But yeah, like I think some, actually someone in the Q and A also mentioned that like, you can actually do some geometric interpretation of this problem. So, yeah, so like, I guess like when I was like younger, I guess like when I don't know much about trig identities, like whenever I see trig, I always draw pictures. Um, so let's see if I can just. So Ivan, you wanna share his board now? <clears throat> sure. Uh... Uh, so yeah, I need to be, okay. Let's see if I can. Uh, oh, only host can share this me? Wait, what? Uh, oh, wait, wait. Is it again those conditions? Yeah. Oh no. Okay. 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 No, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so as uh, well, we mentioned that we we basically want to maximize tangent inverse of x over nine minus tangent inverse of x over sixteen. So let's understand what, like what each angle is. So let's draw a triangle with x and nine well then then which angle then which then which angle is this this is uh x over nine should it should be this angle yeah and, and then we have this angle so let's see if, so 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 as we see like these two these two share share a side so why don't we just put them together mm -hmm. So let's put them together. So 
Nice. If you ask literally, why don't we just put them together? Well, the answer is now we're doing geometry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I I think when I propose this problem, I put it in quotes algebra because I don't I, I, like because the intended solution is actually geometry. So let's see. This is data two. Uh, I think I had it backwards. So so what is so what is data one minus data two? It's this angle, right? Which I'll call alpha. So now the problem becomes uh, there's a point moving on like along this line, and there is like point A and point B, and we basically want to maximize uh, the angle of APB. Uh huh. Then you have power of point. Yeah. So I think I think this is actually one 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 of those problems actually that I did back in high school. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll uh, that like if I rotate this diagram, actually I'll just erase everything for now. Mm -hmm. If I rotate this diagram 90 degrees, it might make more sense. Um, so, so let's imagine that. That was a, a good diagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. AB, AB is like a like AB is a screen like in a movie theater, and yeah. then and then P and P is yourself like sitting on the ground, and you want to get the best view of it. Well, how do you get the best view? You want to maximize the angle, right? So, so, so let's think about, so, so, so maximum angle is like a hard thing to think about, but like, let's think about like, we, we know something about, the, uh, about like, what is the condition for APB to be of a certain angle? In particular, if we draw a circle around APB, uh, that's horrible. Uh, then we know that every point on this circle, on the major arc, AB, like here, here, or here, the, uh, they all have the same angle with, with respect to AB. And we, and we also know that the smaller the circle is, um, the larger the angle is. So we basically want to shrink the, shrink the circle until it barely touches the ground. Uh, drawing, geom the drawing geometric diagrams is hard. Um, Oh, it was this big circle. Yeah. So you basically want this to be tangent. So so now it becomes what, what Zumi mentioned is a power of point. We have that OP is equal to OP squared is equal to OA times OB. Therefore OP is equal to 12, it, which is what we want. And yeah, and this also explains why uh, uh like how Alex mentioned that like there's some sort of symmetry because yeah, because in this case like O A over O P is equal to O P over O B. So these two, so these two are in fact similar triangles and can do some things with it. Yeah. And from here, you still have to use what trig formulas or not? You do, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, both. both uh, I think it basically becomes a sine of sine inverse of four fifths minus sine inverse of three fifths. Uh -huh. Yeah. And this is not. It's not that difficult to compute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in, Yannick, you mentioned like you're going to move like point P, right? Is this related to this like moving points thing people have been talking about in geometry? Uh, I think James might have a better idea of. <laughs> I mean, no. I've just heard this thing going around a lot. <laughs> I mean, you can think of, I mean, if you want to just think of like P moving, like you might think of like APP, the circumcircle of APP is first getting smaller. First, getting smaller because, like, if you're too close to the screen, like, then everything is up there and you cannot see much. And then if you move too far away, then, like, the whole screen is too small for you to see. So, like, if you want to think about it that way, it might help. Okay. So yeah, so even without the circle, it's sort of like the same intuition where, like, I guess in moving points, a lot of like the point is, like, you try to view the diagram as a function of the points you're moving. And then, except like when you use it to prove geometry problems, I think you like actually. Like try to use like algebraic properties of those functions, but like here it's maybe more simple. It's just like when you're really close to the theater, then your angle is zero, and when you're really far away, your angle is also zero. Mm -hmm. and you know, at first it goes up, and later on it goes down. So you just analyze the function. It looks like well, if at zero it goes up, and infinity it goes down, and it starts and ends at zero, it probably has a maximum somewhere in the middle. Right. Yannick, I thought about the other finish. Can you mark OP is twelve, right? Yeah, OP is twelve. So BP is equal to what, 15? 
BP is equal to 15 out oh, yeah. And AP is equal to what? 20. Oh, you can use law of cosines to finish. On the yeah. Way. Even yeah, law of sines for triangle APB, right? You need yeah. angle Oh, yeah, APB. yeah, that totally works, yeah. So seven over sine angle APB is 15 over sine, sine of angle A. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually pretty nice. I think I think that might be like a way you prove uh the angle addition formula. No. I think you can do something like that, yeah. Right. So we explored two very nice approaches. One is the geometry one, the motivation how he made this problem. But then Alex makes the change the problem into you know replace sine by tangent is also a very, very nice touch, right? So we immediately simplify the equation. Okay, so now James, you have the floor, right? You have lots uh, of to um, think about it. You are hard question. Yeah, that question took me a long time. The last two days. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go over this question, and I'm actually going to present two variants afterwards. They're also very interesting. And actually, use as far as I know, are solved in completely different ways. But um, we're going to just reintroduce you to this problem again, which is on which is number ten on the HMNT theme round in 2018. The November tournament that Harvard MIT holds. Um, it's a question about bucks um, on a grid. So basically, um, I won't read the problem again. I'll just kind of give the redefinition, of re, re the problem. So like, we basically want to color the grid with red and blue cells, so that each red, each red cell must touch at most one red cell. So each red cell, okay, each red cell, that's. Red, each red cell touches at um, touches at least three blue cells. Uh, touching mean, meaning like neighboring exactly. So each so each each cell has four neighbors. Um, the way the grid is designed is so that the edges, the left and right edges, and the top and bottom edges are um, glued together. So that each, even the edge cells have four neighbors. So like if you're at the very edge, your neighbor are three cells and the one cell on the other side. So each red cell has to have at least three blue neighbors and each blue cell has at least two red neighbors. Um, and our goal is to maximize the number, I'm uh, sorry, minimize the number of red blue pairs. So um, number of red cells that touch blue cells. Um, so this, this is our condition. Um, how do we go about this? Uh, so our idea last time was to do something algebraically to compute, kind of, to kind of solve for what K, uh, K and B might be. Here we've defined K to be the number of red cells, which is out of the 1 million cells in this grid, how many of them are red? And B is the number of red blue pairs, which we're trying to minimize. Um, we don't actually care about what the value of K is. We just we're gonna end up just using K just to come up with some algebraic identities for us to um, figure out what B is. Um, so do people have any ideas on how we can get one identity first, that uh, inequality relating K and B? I can't see the chat, there's one. Wait, James, that B is a little bit confusing because you have blue and B is red minus blue. Maybe okay, you I, can, I can call D. it D. I can call it D. Different, difference, D. Sorry. Okay, sure. Something. I don't remember why it was B. Oh, because it's a buckaroo, yeah. Oh, that's not a pen. Oh, no, no, wait, the red, blue pairs, not D. What did you want, P? It's fine. Red, blue, it doesn't matter. Uh, P, 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 P is good, seriously. <sighs> Okay. So, because I read it the number red minus blue pairs, sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's a red blue, red, pairs, blue yeah. pairs, yeah. Um yeah, so one thing we can do is we could focus on the red cells and try to get a bound from that. Um so each red cell is a touches four blue cells or touches three blue cells. That means that each red cell corresponds in some sense to either four red blue pairs or three red blue pairs. Because each red cell, each red blue pair involves exactly one red cell. So we can kind of not really by Jack, but we can map each red. You could say that each red cell is the representative of either three or four red blue pairs, and is the unique representative. 
So in that sense, we can get one bound. If you can interpret that algebraically, that bound we get, I'm going to write at the bottom, is that um, k, I believe it's 3k, is at most b. And the reason why is because each, each red cell here um, corresponds to either 3, pe three huh, I meant p, sorry. It corresponds to either three red blue pairs or four red blue pairs, right? So this bound is going to hold. Um, cool. How do we get another bound? P. Oh, fudge. Aye, aye, aye. All right, sounds good. Um, so we can also look at the blue cells because that's a second condition we haven't used yet. Um, and the second condition is that for each blue cell, how many blue cells are there? Well, there's two times one, I'll just write, this is too hard to use. One million minus K. Is also at most at least p um, at most p right. This is because each blue cell touches um, at at least two red cells right. So that means each blue cell, which there are one million minus k of, is going to be the unique representative of at least two pairs. Cool. So we have these two equations. Is there any way we can use these to solve, like to kind of get a bound on p? Well, we don't really care about k, so we can just actually just like this is a pretty simple algebra at this point. We can kind of um, if we multiply this equation by two fifths, I'll just say multiply by two actually, and then add it onto the second equation, which we multiply by three, we can nicely get the fact that now we have, this will imply that P is at least 1,200,000. Um, oh gosh, this is, Horrible to write with. Um, so it's kind of magic what happened here because, like, we kind of like it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like really clever to come up with like a, a way of just like getting these um, inequalities and kind of bound in because we never really care what K is. We kind of introduced K randomly just to get these inequalities and then just got rid of it. But now we've got a bound on P. We're not quite done yet. We need to figure out how you need to construct it if it's possible at all. Right. Uh, so, how do we actually construct in this case? I mean, so if you're going to take this leap of faith, right, you're going to say that like this thing is might actually be the answer is 1.2 million. Yes. But then actually, all of your inequalities have to be equalities. Right. Right. So, if this inequality is equality, if you go back, um, then just going from this, if p equals this, if we take p to be equal to this, then this is going to imply that um, k is equal to 400,000. Um, so that doesn't give us the construction yet, but it kind of gives us an idea what the construction could be. 400,000 is two fifths of all the cells in the, um, in the grid, right? So we need to kind of figure out how are we going to be able to construct something. So we're always going to want something relatively regular or periodic to um, be you able to. inequalities, right? You have two more inequalities on top of the inequality you just wrote that are also equal. So each red has exactly three blue and each blue has exactly two red. Right, right. Each red has exactly three blue. Each blue has exactly two red. Uh, but that's like not as clear how you're, I guess that makes sense, right? Because each each red has exactly three blue is going to be enough to um, kind of fix the red cells a little bit. So if you take like any red cell, if you have at least three blue. Well, you um, have exactly three blue, right? Sorry, so exactly three blue. That means this is three or blue. That means this one's going to be red. Uh, and then these three next to it are all going to be blue. Yes, and then you need to construct things around to see what patterns can be. Right. Um, so then each blue has to touch exactly two red now. Um, I think this is like, it's not clear how you go about this right away, if I understand it. Like there's, yeah, I mean, there's still some freedom. So one way you can think about this is that you want k to be four hundred thousand or two fifths of the cells. So what is a good way of like regularly constructing things like with kind of period five? Um, well, conveniently there is a square of size area five in this grid, right? 
the square is this square right here has area five. Uh, which is pretty great. So if we like, what if we like create this as our like, if we're periodic modulo this square or this lattice, um, the lattice that's formed by repeating the square. And in that case, you just have like this Azure um, coloring. And then you just copy, or, uh, copy just basically modulo this lattice. If you guys are at all familiar with like, I don't know, ideal class, whatever, it's fine. Um, yeah, let's just do this. Something like this. It's kind of, I'm not going to be able to draw the whole entire pattern out, but it's going to be it's going to look something like this. And this ends up working because modulo five you can wrap around to all thousand by thousand because a thousand is divisible by five. Um, so this is a construction that works. It's a very not obvious construction because uh, that's what makes this like an interesting short answer problem. And then this, but this construction is able to create a bound that works. Um, but so the, uh, for at least for that problem, but like this is not the only question you could ask about this problem. Uh, minimizing number of red blue pairs. You could also try another kind of question, which is like, can you kind of find bounds on k, which is just the number of red cells and that you have. Um, if you're able to maximize the number of red cells, what is the maximum number of red cells you can have in the grid, and what is the minimum number of red cells you can have in the grid? Um, do people have guesses on what the answer might be here? Or have intuitions? Well, I mean, okay, so this is very stupid intuition, but two fifths, right? The two closest fractions to two fifths are one third and one half. So I'm gonna guess that the minimum is one third, maximum, maximum is one half. <laughs> Uh, I think that actually ends up being correct. Well, um, it, well, it doesn't work obviously for one thousand by one thousand. Yeah. Like, so what one? Don't don't worry about that much. Like one third is not going to work. Yeah, for this grid in particular. Um, but is the construction for one million two hundred thousand unique? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, this is pretty fixed of a construction. But um, if so, I encourage you guys to think about that. We're going to go over that next time. But. In addition to that question, for the maximum version of the question, uh, you should also think about the possible constructions there are, because there are actually a lot of possible, very different, unique constructions that you can think about. Um, so, so that's that, that's a homework problem for next time. And you, I don't know if you're going to be able to do this with algebra. I encourage you guys to try, because I was not able to right away, but I had another method that I thought was really cool and I want to share with you guys. Um, is there anything anyone else? Want to say about this problem or I tried? Well, before you close, I want to add something on this because I feel like all the audience here or maybe the audience read, uh, watch our videos during the day instead of, in, instead of the, uh, live in the evening. Many of them are very into contests. And, uh, but when they go to contests, uh, even like myself, taking my students go to contest or when I was young doing mass contests on my own, more likely is I only focus on the contest results and the contest during that day. And many times, many wonderful problems, actually, people don't do them anymore. But then you feel like, in particular for contests like HMMT, they have so many wonderful problems. The problem is so hard. And many times, students only can get less than half of the uh, problems. So if you really want to improve, I think all of you guys should go back and study those hard problems that you didn't solve. Because actually there are so many gems over there, like this one, yeah. right? Um, so it's really good to, to, to really, after the test, to cool down and after months and then come back to revisit. That will help your math to increase by a lot. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely got heard criticized that kind of like comment about HMT this year. Uh, this year's HMT was, as usual, it's pretty difficult. I think this year is a little more difficult than usual, but um, a lot of the problems um, uh, were actually, like we've spent a lot of time, me and the other problems are on making really, really high quality problems. I'm, I'm personally really proud of a lot of them. And I think people in general agree that a lot of the problems are very, very good. I think they're probably more interesting to solve than like even some of the AMC problems that you guys might encounter uh, that most people see. 
Uh, but yeah, I definitely go back and solve those because I think uh, the, a lot of the college competition problems are uh, the mo more interesting short answer problems that I end up uh, doing. Um, they're really great, uh, even though most people were able to like uh, even try most of them with right. the contest. And the key um, is now you have time, you should sit down and really do them on their own, on your own, and don't rush to the solution because every time. I do a few problems or my friends, you know, other coaches that I know, some of them here, some of them in China, we do them and we find other ways and we find it very interesting. And then we tell you guys too, but, but the key is don't read the solution rather is, you know, you don't have time pressure and you should do them on your own and that improves your math. Yeah, and this is Chris here, just to follow on to what Zhu Ming said, I remember listening to a talk given by Ravi Vakil, who some of you, may know some of the books he's written. He did the Putnam back in the 90s. And, you know, so he's been into math competitions. And he said that it's very kind of popular to look at the contest in terms of what's happening on the day of, because that's kind of when all the action's happening. But if you look deeper at it, what's really important, if you really want to know this well, is what activities go on before the contest and what activities go on after the contest. And in particular, you shouldn't just skim over a solution and then say, okay, now I know how the solution, you should really think about it and try to solve it on your own and spend time with it if you really want to improve and not just kind of fire and forget. So. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I mean, I'm just talking about like, I, I just wrote the problems that I want people to think about afterwards. Um, if you guys kind of get stuck a little bit about it, uh, I definitely encourage you guys to think um, about like what I mentioned last time, which actually didn't end up being really relevant to this version of the problem, but are, is more relevant to the other uh, ver two alternative versions I proposed, which is like connected components, kind of looking at the actual components of how the red and blue cells touch, because we didn't really use that as much here. We're kind of like, for this problem, we kind of really focused on each red and each blue cell individually and how it relates to the rest of the grid. But if you kind of like consider cells locally, and kind of playing with the how cells um, interact in like small groups, um, I think it might help with these two problems as well. And it's less algebraic in the sense and more geometrical. Uh, yeah, and then if you're kind of interested in this original problem, version of the problem, I think Evan mentioned that this reminded him a lot of a 2002 US six, which involves a similar kind of construction, in like a, fi a five periodic construction. So if you're interested in this kind of problem, you could have to look at that. Um, yeah. yeah. So we are going to close here. Um, and uh, maybe, James, you will email us the exact uh, question, uh, the, the, the two follow up questions, and Ivan will post it on the PDF over there for people to think about it. So okay. they are more prepared for next Tuesday. Right? Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, guys, just a little note. I posted in the chat the link to to this show, you can find all the episodes there, except this one yet, and all the problem sets with the, with the sources of the competitions they were proposed, okay? So feel free to use it, to watch again, and share with your friends. Yeah, we do it for you. So everyone, good night.